Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I, my name is Judy Gassner, and I'm with the Torrance Memorial Foundation, and we're just thrilled that you are here. And while I wish we could see you in person, we're happy that you're visiting with us virtually. Actually, this format has given us an extensive audience reach, so we're very grateful. We're so thrilled to be presenting this lecture. Many of you contacted us in the foundation during the pandemic and asked so many questions. And now you will hear firsthand from one of our infectious disease experts, Dr. James McKinnell. Before we officially begin, I'd like to acknowledge a very special person uh, in the audience tonight, Sally Eberhard. Sally retired after 34 years. She worked closely with our president and CEO, Craig Leach. Sally was the vice president, senior v vice president of planning and development and mentored and influenced and inspired many. She also played a critical role in the success of Torrance Memorial and where it is today. Sally, we miss you greatly. And now we'll officially begin, and I have the great honor to, in, to introduce Dr. Mark Lurie, who will serve as your moderator. It's a great privilege, and Mark, Dr. Lurie is a great friend. He has retired after a 42-year 40 year practice as a beloved cardiologist. He leaves an indelible mark throughout a remarkable career. One time I was with him and one of his patients said, Dr. Lurie, you are the gold standard. And that he is. He's been respected and admired for all of his patients. Thankfully, he still will be with us. Uh, he is the medical director of the Lundquist Lurie Cardiovascular Institute. He serves as president of the Torrance Memorial Foundation Board, and he is a trustee of the hospital. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mark Lurie. Judy, thank you. Uh, that was quite an introduction, and thank you all. Uh, this is great. Number one, it's a great lecture and a great topic, of course, and I'd like to thank all of you who are participating. Um, I want to thank Judy and the whole gang and the foundation for, and her committee for the miracle of living at the beach. It's uh, very encouraging to see how many people have applied to, this, to see this lecture tonight who have registered. And I, I think it's well worth it. There's the usual, you know, when we have them non-virtual, there's the usual housekeeping, but it's easy for me to remind you, you know where your kitchen is and you know where the bathroom is. And so you can, you're free to do as you will. Tonight, Again, you know we're gonna talk about the pandemic and it's something that's certainly spread across the country, across the world and caused such anxiety and such fear. And it's something that I think that you're gonna find out how well Torrance Memorial worked to do to get this well under control for the community and was really one of the leaders. And I just found out probably one of the leaders in the country was the way they were able to introduce their therapies and treat the patients and a very outstanding record. The, there were physician-led teams and it was well integrated and these people worked their tails off. I sat in on the meetings, I didn't have to do the work they did. And it was a daily, daily uh, workload that probably something when I was in practice I could never have handled. And I give credit to them. Among the leaders in this was the infectious disease team and you're gonna meet Dr. McKinnell, one of the, uh, one of the members and one of the leading members and they were able to bring us through this to what you know now is probably, hopefully, the light at the end of the tunnel. So Dr. McKinnell uh, is a gentleman who's joined the infectious disease team, works with Malevchik and RAN, and he's been here for 10 years. He's got quite a record. He uh, went to Stanford as an undergrad, Columbia Med School, and uh, so you can see he's very high level. He did his uh, residency at Harvard, UCLA, and in infectious disease at University of Alabama. He's been involved in research to a great degree in, with COVID and uh, various infectious disease areas. 
I would probably take up the rest of the lecture if I went through his record, but let, leave it uh, be said that this gentleman has really done his work. He's really quite famous. He's really quite ambitious and a very bright person, personable, well, easy to talk to, and I'm proud to be able to introduce Dr. McKenna. Thank you very much for that great introduction. And um, to be honest, I'm a little bit humbled to follow the gold standard. That's a, that's a pretty great compliment. That's a good one. Uh, so my name is Dr. James McKinnell. I'm an infectious disease specialist. And as mentioned, I work with the Electric Ram Group. And I wanted to tell you a little bit more about how we experienced the COVID pandemic, both in the United States and across the, across the, the, the globe and also specifically how it affected our community here in the South Bay and Torrance Memorial in particular. So I wanted to start with just an introduction as to who's this guy speaking to. Um, and it's worthwhile to sort of explain how I got interested in infectious disease. And I spent my early childhood in a relatively privileged background in Greenwich, Connecticut. I attended a, a private day school. I really was kind of uh, in, a, in a very unique part of the world. And in the mid 80s, uh, we had the emergence of the AIDS pandemic. And that for me was a really important event in my own life. I identified an area in the world, i.e. medicine, where I could actually take an opportunity to use my time to help people. And making a living helping people was just, it was easy for me. Well, that makes sense. If I can make money helping people, that's a great career. And so I, I dedicated myself to pursue the field of infectious disease. So I'm a specialist in the treatment and prevention of communicable diseases. So for those of you in the audience that may not be so familiar with that, we treat common conditions like pneumonia, skin infections, urinary tract infections. We'll treat viral infections like HIV, influenza, hepatitis, but perhaps most interestingly and probably most relevant is that we also treat some very bizarre things. So we'll know, we know how to treat malaria and parasites and leprosy. And in the sort of medical community, I'm what you'll call a super nerd. Like I really get into the science and the detail and I really enjoy this stuff. So I'm a bit of a science nerd. And so with that introduction, I think you'll understand more about how I present the information as we go through it. Um, as described, I was committed and really knew early on that I wanted to specialize and excel in infectious disease. I attended a private boarding school. I went to Stanford, and then I went to Columbia. When I started my medical practice after I finished my training, my first job out of training was work, working with the Malefchek Ram Medical Group. So I've been working with Eric Malefchek and David Ram for 10 years really committed myself to just the practice of medicine. A lot of academics and sort of super nerds and in infectious disease miss out on the nuts and bolts of medicine. But I spent 10 years working in the hospital and I'm committed to supporting the hospital and I'm the co-chair of the Florence Memorial Young Physicians and Professionals Association. I am an academic investigator. I've published in multiple journals, New England Journal of Medicine, Clinical Infectious Disease, and that really was a primary driver. I'm really proud that in 2019, I was nominated and awarded the Infectious Disease Society of America Young Investigator Award. That's a big deal for me, and it really sort of cemented myself in this academic realm. The third part of my career is I'm a public health specialist. I worked for years with the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health. I'm currently working with the Orange County Healthcare Association there, public health department. And I've run a company called Expert Stewardship to help with infection prevention. So when the COVID epidemic hit, this was really kind of my space to join in with. And I want to share kind of some of my perspectives as to what we saw. So to start a lecture about healthcare and medicine, I want to frame the conversation by letting you guys understand what the common causes of death are in the U.S. And so Dr. Lurie is a cardiologist. He's aware that heart disease is the number one killer of Americans and has been every year since forever. It's about 648,000 deaths. And you can see the top five leading causes of death. This is data from 2017. It's the most, most recent data we have, but that's to give you some sort of frame of reference. 
I'll also share with you data about influenza. And so this was the data from the influenza season 2019 to 2020. And you can see that there are 38 million infections of influenza in that season. That's about average, if I'm honest. There were 400,000 hospitalizations and about 21,000 deaths. It was actually a light year for hospitalizations and deaths with influenza. This ranges from 20 to 60,000 deaths every year. And that's a very common infection that we would treat. I'll compare a regular influenza season, albeit a late one, against COVID. And so this is COVID from roughly February of 2020 until May of 2021. So it is a little bit more than a year, but not too much. And I think you can understand why I've shared this. So much like influenza, 37 million infections. But this is where it gets impressive. 2.2 million hospitalizations and 583,000 deaths from COVID. COVID in the 2020 and 2021 season is approaching cancer in terms of the number of deaths per year. It really was a huge public health impact and a dramatic change that everyone's experienced. We've all experienced the trauma of social isolation, not being able to go out. But this is why all of those reactions were required is, you know, this was a relative success in some ways. So what happened? How did we get so many cases? Where did this all come from? And so I wanna be clear so that everyone understands where COVID started. And I did tell you I was a bit of a super nerd, so here's some of your science, and I apologize ahead of time. But on your left, you're looking at a horseshoe bat. And the horseshoe bat is actually, um, it lives in Southeast Asia. So if you look here, it's this area in blue. And if you notice, it doesn't actually cover Wuhan, but does cover most of southern China, Cambodia, and Thailand. Now, this bat has been a public health menace for decades. These bats generate coronavirus, and they don't get sick because of this. SARS-CoV-2 is associated with one of those particular bat-related coronaviruses. Just for frame of reference, this is how the original SARS in 2003 was spread, because of the same bat. Now, what was interesting is that it wasn't just the bat virus. It actually crossed with virus from another animal called a pangolin. I'm not sure if my wife is, in, is included in this, is watching this lecture right now, but I like the cute animal pictures. So you saw the bat and this really cool looking pangolin. But there was probably a recombination event between the pangolin virus and the bat virus. And so you should be thinking, well, how would that happen? Where would that occur? And unfortunately, the answer is in China, wholesale of hunted meat is legal. Not legal anywhere else really in the world, but in China, you can go out and kill a pangolin or kill a bat and sell the meat for profit. And that really is sort of why the Wuhan market became the center of this epidemic. We know this from a lot of the very specific DNA genealogy type testing we did on prior samples of the SARS coronavirus. So from Wuhan, you saw spread of this virus right through and across China. We were watching this early on. You saw some of the stories of cruise ships in that area, but we really had identified this as, as an Asian phenomenon. And a lot of people were thinking, oh, well, it's going to be like the SARS of 2013. It'll burn out. What was well chosen was that we actually limited travel from Asia very, very early on in the epidemic. What we didn't do was limit travel from Europe. And you could watch, if you're watching these slides over time as this epidemic was evolving, the virus was originally in Southeast Asia, moved through the Middle East, went through Turkey, and then spread largely through Europe from there. And we had huge epidemics in Italy, France, Germany, and Spain, well before we really had a big introduction of the virus in the United States. The virus in the United States largely came in through air travel. And a lot of the original wave of viral introduction was from Europe. And you can see that they're in the major urban centers across the US. And as we all know, it just simply spread A, through those urban centers and outwards to the rest of the country. New York was hit particularly hard early in the epidemic, and they had mass casualty hospitals set up very quickly because of how fast it spread through that city. 
I want to share with you guys today three factors for why the virus spread so rapidly through the U.S. Now, this is relevant for you in the audience because, A, you can use this going forward to prevent influenza and other viruses, but also to explain why this occurred, where this came from. So the first one I want to talk about is failure of social distancing. The second one is understanding hand hygiene, how to properly wash your hands and when to wash your hands. And then lastly, understanding a little bit more about personal protective equipment. For most of you in the audience, I'm in face masks. So this was a letter to the editor in the New England Journal of Medicine that was published very early on in the epidemic and was a really important paper because it very clearly described that people that didn't have symptoms of COVID could still transmit. So this image is interesting because what you can see here is there was a traveler that came from China that visited Germany. This is this person in red. This is this person in red, right here. And he left on a flight to China and only after leaving did he develop symptoms. So his entire time in Germany, he had no symptoms. He attended business meetings and multiple patients, in fact, patient one, patient two, patient three, and patient four, all became infected from contacts of this person who was asymptomatic. Really landmark paper to say, look, this was a major problem. Unfortunately, this paper, although published in the New England Journal, was missed by many public health experts. This was a catastrophic failure, really not understanding the dynamics of asymptomatic transmission and staying away from people that might possibly be infected. That was a, a big learning event for us and we didn't have it at the time. Hand hygiene. So as an infectious disease specialist, I watch people all the time and look at how they wash their hands and what they do with their hands. And what's very clear is that a lot of people could learn a little bit about hand hygiene. So I'll share the first one, and this is a concept that most infectious disease specialists know, which is hand discipline. And so what, we've, what you see here is, a, is an experiment that we do. We put a, a, a glow, um, a glow germ or a UV dye on the hands, and we watch what you do with the hands. And if you watch, you will see people lean and put their face on their hands. They'll touch their glasses. They'll fix their hair. And the rule is, whenever you do that, you're introducing all of the bacteria in your environment right to your face. And you can actually see here on this slide over here, you can see that that person has put that, those, that glow germ on their face. So the rule for hand hygiene is never let your hands go above your collar or below your waist without washing them. It's very simple. So you'll see people be you watch anywhere you go, you'll see it happen all the time. Watch in a, in a meeting or a, or a supermarket, and every single time you bring your hands up to your face, you're introducing not only possible COVID, but any one of the other respiratory viruses or bacteria right into your system. So number one, the U.S. classically has really bad hand hygiene. The second is that we don't know how to wash our hands. So... <laughs> I'm gonna do a little demonstration. You can see my hands today. So you can imagine I have some alcohol. And the way we do this is you first start by squirting alcohol in your hand and you rub them together. Now, most people stop. They go, okay, I'm done, I wash my hands. And the answer there is no. The back of your hands are dirty and other parts of your hands are dirty. So rub your palms together, rub the back of your hands, interlace your fingers, Get the wrist, wrist, thumb, thumb, fingertip, fingertip. Now I'm not gonna do that again. There's a fantastic YouTube video of a guy washing his hands with hand paint. If you haven't seen it, you should go look at it now. But it's clear that this is not a lesson that our parents and grandparents taught us so well. So there's your remedial class. The last one that I think was an area for potential improvement is understanding face masks and understanding how they're supposed to be used and how we're supposed to protect ourselves from infection. So when COVID first hit, this is what most people thought of as the best way to protect themselves from COVID. 
what you see is you see people in Tyvek suits with masks on, with N95s on, double gloved. They have pappers on. This was thought to be the best way to, to protect yourself from COVID. I think I saw someone in the Vons in Hermosa Beach wearing this. And I'm pretty sure someone up in Rolling Hills tried something similar. But this was kind of the idea. And I'll be honest, I kind of laughed. And the reason why I laughed is it reminded me of this scene from E.T. So I might be dating myself, but this is the classic scene from E.T. when the federal government comes to find the alien. And this is what they thought about the means to prevent transmission. So um, the next time you see someone in the supermarket like that, just think of E.T. And, um, if you haven't seen the movie, then shame on you and go watch it because it's a fantastic movie. But this is really a novel concept. And I, I want to share with you why I kind of laugh. And on the image of the left here, you can see again what the healthcare workers in Wuhan were doing for COVID. And what you can see on the right is what we were recommending in the U.S. to prevent COVID. And it was kind of standard stuff. It was wear a mask, wear goggles, plus or minus if I'm honest, um, wear a gown, wear gloves. And that was pretty straightforward. The key was we all knew how to do that well. And the fact of the matter is nobody, not nobody, but very few people actually know the process to properly get into a Tyvek suit. I've been trained. It is really hard. I'm not flexible enough anymore. I'm not 18 like when I was when I learned it. It is hard to get into these suits well. And the fact of the matter is that doing the perfect amount well is better than doing the Tyvek suit ET process poorly. And the science is clear. Nearly a third of healthcare workers in Wuhan, China were infected with the virus. In the US, our experience is way less than 3%. That's pre-vaccine. So wearing the right equipment well works. Now, unfortunately, the general public has a little bit to learn about this. <laughs> So my favorite is this guy here in the top right with his mask under his chin. I see that all the time. Um, and there's some other ones here. You can see the lady on the lower left. She's got her nose sticking out of her mask. That's totally useless. Um, for a little while, the two people drinking straws out of their mask was kind of a joke until I actually saw it in Hermosa. And I was really hurt that someone was actually cut a hole and they were drinking their drink through a straw. And it was a mess. In the bottom, this guy who's covering his mask with his hand, notice I didn't touch my face, um, covering his mask with his hand, the front of your mask is a viral particle concentrator. All of the virus in the room is concentrated on the front of the mask, and he's now put that on his hand. He's also crushed the mask, so the structure of the mask is lost. The lady in the top corner, again, with the, the cloth mask over the, fa over the surgical face mask, Double masking is a joke. It doesn't work. It makes you try and pass out. It doesn't help protect anything. A regular surgical mask is best. And this is something that is, that is I'll say again, that cloth mask in the bottom. Cloth masks are good. It helps prevent you from transmitting infection to somebody else. But if you want to prevent getting infected yourself, a surgical mask is certainly the way to go. So those are sort of the pitfalls. Those are sort of the things we didn't get right. But the fact of the matter is, as Dr. Lurie said, we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. So what changed? What was the big difference? And the first one is we learned how to test for the disease. This is one of the most magnificent things about the internet is within a week of COVID exploding in Wuhan, the actual genetic code for the COVID virus was shared widely. This was really important because now all the laboratory testing manufacturers could start developing assays for that virus. It was a huge step forward. The next thing is science actually determined the best available treatment. And I'll explain a little bit more about that. And the last one, obviously, is vaccine development. We've seen a huge outpouring of vaccine um, administration across Los Angeles and the U.S., and it's been a huge windfall for the, for the epidemic. So relatively early on in the pandemic, August, so six months into this, the idea of doing mass testing was becoming more feasible. Credit where credit's due, the Los Angeles County Fire Department, yes, LA County Fire Department pioneered community-based mass testing with all of their testing sites. So Clayton Kazan, who's, a, a, I'll be honest, a bit of a visionary here, 
really launched that program. And that expanded out into other areas. So we were able to do mass testing across nursing homes, all sorts of different environments. Mass testing, I'll spare the science. Actually, if you can identify people who are infected, particularly people that think maybe I have COVID and they actually do, if you tell them they have COVID, they're less likely to spread the virus to others. So just the process of testing alone can slow the spread of the virus. Now here at Torrance Memorial, our early phases of the epidemic, we had to collect a specimen from a patient, ship it off to a reference laboratory and wait for the reference laboratory to get a test and then send us back the result. The turnaround time from when somebody got admitted to the hospital was in the order of days. So you'd have someone in the hospital, you think, well, I think they have COVID. I still think they have COVID. I still think they have COVID, but I'm not sure. Or do I treat before I get a test result? This is a picture of one of our platforms. This is the BD Max platform. There's a few here. There's a Thermo Fisher platform and others. This dramatically changed the way we treated patients here at the hospital. Number one, not only was I given the information about was a patient positive or not, I got it within hours. So I could make rapid treatment decisions. The other component of this is we started putting all patients in isolation until we got their negative test result. And that really was one of the keys to success, why we haven't had any patient transmission of COVID. We were really strict about our infection prevention. We were really strict about how we wore our face masks, really strict about isolation, and people only came out of isolation when infectious disease experts had reviewed the case and made that decision. And really the availability of that rapid testing platform was game changer. That was not a minor investment. I know that's a very expensive machine. We certainly use the daylights out of it, but big major investment that changed the way we could treat patients here. Science determines the best available treatment and our hospital was there to make it happen. So I really like this slide. So I'm gonna take a second to go through it and explain to you what you're looking at. So the NIH here is the National Institutes for Health. And what was great is relatively early on in the pandemic, they convened a group of experts to review all of the medical literature and make recommendations about individual drugs. So you can see the first drug there, remdesivir, that's a medication that we've used a lot of for the treatment of COVID. Very early on by May of 2020, they recognized that that was a valuable treatment in the management of COVID. It's again, something we've been doing, so that wasn't surprising to us. But the second drug here is a drug called hydroxychloroquine. There was a tremendous amount of interest in the use of hydroxychloroquine January, February, and March of 2020. There was a very nice clinical trial that was published out of France. And I'll be honest, I was excited by the data and I used that drug because we thought that was gonna be a good drug to use in COVID. What we subsequently have learned was that, no, it doesn't work. There's really no benefit and there's some risks to using that drug. So you can see here by the different changes in color that there was a lot of evolution of how we thought about COVID, how we approached this disease, because the science was coming fast and furious. Perhaps the most exciting component of all of this epidemic was that the four key infectious disease physicians. And I've obviously introduced our Dr. Eric Malefchik and Dr. Dave Rand, but Dr. Vladimir Lavalo and I, we would sit down at 7.30, 8 o'clock every day and talk about the most recent clinical trial results, what our various opportunities were for treatment, how our patients were doing, and it really became a, a collaborative to determine the best available treatment. These are some of the most contentious conversations as we had very strong opinions each way, but it was very beneficial. And I wanna share an example of one drug that we got excited about very, very early on. So this drug is called tocilizumab. And tocilizumab is a drug that's really only used for the management of complex patients with autoimmune diseases. And it really is, it's a modulator of the immune system. And to spare you a lot of science, a lot of COVID is not just the virus hurting you, but your body's immune system's response. And so 
in March of 2020, we saw some very encouraging data out of China and with some of our colleagues about the use of this drug. Now, the drug was FDA approved, but not for COVID. So you could buy it. And unlike other drugs that were under study, we could just buy this drug and use it. This drug costs about $2,500 a dose. And the data to support its use was not so solid as others, but we saw potential. The group of us talked about this drug, thought there was an opportunity for benefit, and we approached the hospital and said, is this something we can use? I honestly thought the answer was going to be no. I'm honestly surprised I was invited to give this lecture because I ended up using a lot of this drug. Um, but what we found was this drug actually had benefit for patients, and it really had a dramatic impact in some cases. So the curve you're looking at here, this is a patient who, when they first was, were admitted in uh, March 22nd of 2020, they had a fever of over 100 degrees. You can see that line. And this is classic for this disease in this presentation. And around 6 o'clock in the morning on March 23rd, you can see that massive rise in their temperature curve. They got their temperature up to 103, 104 degrees. This syndrome is something called cytokine release syndrome, and this is fatal. This is what kills patients. So I knew that with this particular patient, his risk of death to me was 80%. I thought this was a never gonna survive kind of scenario. So as a Hail Mary move or Doug Flutie pass to the end zone, I said, let me try tocilizumab. And this is where the conversation happened. And you can see within 12 hours of giving that drug, this patient's fever stopped. Their COVID disease stopped in its track. We still had to keep managing them. And it took a while to get this patient out of the hospital. But this was a, a nursing home patient that got to return to their nursing home. And um, last I checked, was still doing well. So that's one of those examples of, of how things can work together if we're able to, to collaborate and, and make things work. And I'll be honest. Um, I'm a little bit proud that we made that move in March of 2020, and you can see the NIH only caught on in March of 2021. So um, we were a little ahead of the curve, and that's a lot of what we were doing early on based on our conversations has proven to be best available treatment. And that's, that's something I'm really proud of. I'm proud of that collaborative and what we were able to do through this whole pandemic. The other thing we learned through the pandemic is that critical care management oxygen management, nursing, and their role in patient positioning was crucial to the outcome of these patients. One of our key maneuvers, oddly enough, is flipping patients on their stomach. Now, if you spend time laying on your stomach, trust me, it gets uncomfortable after a little. Our nurses really learned how to work with patients, how to position them so that they could tolerate that and to explain to them why these were important, why opening your lungs up was so key. And we developed a core group of nurses that honestly were COVID specialists. We intentionally shifted our sicker patients down there. And this picture is another photo I'm actually really proud of. So this is our step down unit, the Three West Progressive Care Unit. This isn't an ICU, this is sort of where you go after the ICU. Traditionally, you don't put ventilators here. Traditionally, this is not intensive care unit level of care. Through the course of the pandemic, during the surge, we converted essentially this entire floor to another ICU. And these nurses who you can see here learn ventilator management, learn pressor management, and did it exceptionally well. That was a phenomenal transition of the hospital being flexible in terms of how we could handle these things. And from my perspective, it went seamlessly. Now, I'm sure it wasn't seamless from everyone's perspective, but for me, it was amazing. We just sort of had an extension of the ICU. 1,750 COVID admissions. Now, that number is probably low by now. Early adoption of best available treatment, exceptional treatment success, rapid and fluid expansion of the ICU, COVID nursing specialists, and laboratory capacity development. This was a dream place to work through this epidemic. There's no doubt about it. The last thing, which is more of a, a public health global perspective, is understanding vaccine development and what that means for the pandemic. So in about, oh, I forget when Dave Rand asked me this question. It might have been June of the pandemic. The question was, how good does a vaccine have to be for it to work? 
For those of you that know much about vaccines, you know the influenza vaccine is fairly good, 65 to 70% efficacy, where a vaccine like polio is close to 100%. And it was such a good question that I actually turned to a group of data scientists from the Johns Hopkins University. and We developed a national model of COVID transmission to try to understand how good would a vaccine have to be to stop the epidemic if that's the only thing we did. And so it was some complex transmission dynamics and modeling, and it was a fun project to do. Um, but what we came up with was if 100% of the population got vaccinated, then a vaccine only had to be about 60% effective to stop the pandemic. And if only 60% of the population got vaccinated, well, the vaccine had to be 80%. And so I, I told this to Dave, and I think at the time I told him it was a back of the napkin calculation. Um, it was a little bit more than a back of a napkin calculation. Um, but this paper actually got public health article of the year. It was a really great question. It was a really great project. And that was something that came straight out of real clinical need. Um, and is a really important point for us to describe. And to be honest, it actually sets the framework for this conversation about vaccines more than I ever expected it would. So just a guide to your vaccines. These are sort of the four most commonly talked about ones. Um, to put things in perspective, there's about 50 of these things. Um, the Pfizer uh, bio biotech uh, vaccine is an mRNA vaccine. Moderna is also an mRNA vaccine. And the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, this is a more traditional viral vector. You give it with an adenovirus, it's kind of a wimpy virus. That's much like other vaccines uh, we've all had growing up. And the, the key here, I wanna draw you to a couple numbers lower down in the slide. So the J&J &J vaccine in terms of disease prevention is about 60%, 66% effective, whereas the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are 95% effective. Now, the J&J &J vaccine absolutely prevents hospitalization, absolutely prevents death, but from a disease transmission dynamic, I'm gonna focus on those 66% and 95% numbers. Now, what is an mRNA vaccine and what, what, where does this all about? What do we, why do we care about this? Why haven't we had these before? So I wanna sort of briefly go through the science here. I don't wanna put anyone to sleep here, but an mRNA vaccine is unique not because of mRNA, mRNA goes into the cell and that's converted to proteins, but we've never been able to get mRNA into a human cell. It just, we haven't been able to do it. So the major breakthrough in the last three years or before COVID was that we started to get this lipid envelope, this blue lipid envelope to work so that now we could finally deliver mRNA into the cell. And that discovery occurred actually before COVID. And so there was some money put into that science development, but not a lot. And it suddenly became after the emergence of COVID that that became a game-changing technology. And I would encourage all of you to spend a little bit more time learning about mRNA vaccines because not only are they beneficial for COVID, they're probably beneficial to influenza. They're also probably beneficial to cancer chemotherapeutics and other areas. This is potentially a game changer kind of revolution. So that's a huge breakthrough, not just for COVID, but for medical care in general. This is the national impact of the COVID vaccine. What you can see is that we hit a peak in late January of 300,000 cases per day of of uh, COVID in the US and it was staggering. Our hospital was full, we were busy. We had a couple hundred patients with COVID in the hospital and you can see that it, it dropped dramatically. To sort of put a finer point on it, a lot of the work that my company does looks at COVID control in long-term care facilities. So nursing homes and residential facilities. And you can see here, January and February went from a peak of 70 to 80 buildings with outbreaks down to zero because of the COVID vaccine. In terms of patient numbers, we were at a peak of 780 cases in the 51st week of the year. So that's kind of Christmas time, guys. 780 new cases in long-term care patients, down to one or zero now in these patients. This is a, a disease in this population with a 20% mortality. 
huge impacts from the COVID vaccine. And I'm really proud of this picture. Um, this was my one of my proudest days of 2020. This is the day that I got my, my COVID vaccine. Um, I included a picture of Matt Ostrom, who's one of our, um, our cardiologists here. And I like this picture because I look taller than Matt. And I look a little, maybe not skinnier than Matt, but at least I look taller than Matt. If you know Matt, he's quite a bit taller than I am, but I like this picture. He and I were co-residents together. So um, sorry for throwing you in the top, Matt, if you're listening. So I really would argue here, vaccination is key. And one of the things that we've seen is that with widespread distribution of the vaccine, the concept of vaccine hesitancy or people being afraid of the vaccine has started to wane. And you can see here that 62% of the population has either hard, already gotten the vaccine or is really anxious to get the vaccine in this survey and done in March of 2021. There is still a population of people that are definitely not getting the vaccine or only getting it if, it require, if it's required. And I, if I'm honest, wouldn't have thought it would have been that high. Um, and when I talk to you guys about these vaccine efficacy thresholds, this is where this is relevant, where you can start to see failures of people where people who don't get vaccinated will become spreaders to others. No conversation about this would be complete without talking about COVID variants. And I'm not going to do all of them. I will do the top four. So the UK variant is B117. The South African variant is B1351. The Brazilian variant is P1. And we have a California variant. We suffered through the California variant around Christmas time. It was really challenging. It clearly was more transmissible. I think it was actually more deadly than uh, the non-California variant. It's a bit academic. But for the purposes of this conversation, our vaccines seem to work just fine against the UK variant. Maybe not so much about the South, against the South African or the Brazilian variant, suggesting that yeah, there might be some impact about vaccine efficacy. So if you combine hesitancy with maybe some of these variants being harder to control, you can start to see a little bit of a gap in the armor. More specifically, there's a report from the New England Journal of Medicine of a few patients who are clearly COVID infected after getting the COVID vaccine, well after they should have been immune. And perhaps most concerningly, there's at least one report of a skilled nursing facility in Kentucky where they did actually have a COVID outbreak amongst largely vaccinated patients. Now, before everyone runs to the hills, the disease is clearly less aggressive in those patients, but uh, you know, this is not a perfect suit of armor. It's excellent and it changes how we handle daily life. And if people get vaccinated, yes, a lot of this will be will be a, a, a good development for us. But while we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, we still have to be a little bit cautious, especially around people that may or may not be vaccinated. A couple other things I'll just touch on briefly before I close. I was asked to comment on long haulers, and no, I don't mean truckers. Um, the other one is active research at Tolerance Memorial, sort of what are we doing here? How, what have we been doing and where are we going? So long haulers are patients who have recovered from COVID but have persistent symptoms. This was first described largely in Chinese patients where they reported that 75% of hospitalized patients had some symptoms six months after discharge. And that's not too terribly exciting because we can see that for other diseases. Unfortunately, we're starting to see some unique syndromes, including some cardiovascular syndromes and neurologic syndromes that occur long after people have recovered from COVID. We have a growing clinical trial network here at Torrance Memorial, where one of our newer studies is actually potentially looking at an herbal medication to regulate the immune system, much like we do with tocilizumab, but it's a little bit um, uh, more tolerable, we hope. So we'll see what that one looks like. Um, some monoclonal antibody treatments for COVID, not prevention, but actual treatment. Um, some of the anticoagulation strategies we're studying. And then we do have a long-term observational cohort to look at some of these patients over time. So active and growing clinical trial programs so we can bring the best treatments to our patients. Pandemics happen. And the question is not if, but when. I was drawn into medicine because of 
the AIDS epidemic. And I hope the next generation of infectious disease physicians is inspired by COVID. There's a few lessons that I think are worthy of reviewing. Number one, Americans have just been introduced to the concept of infection prevention and PPE. With wearing masks and washing hands, flu essentially didn't happen this year. I don't think I saw a case all winter, and that's never happened in my career. Watch the YouTube hand washing video. Consider wearing masks in public spaces. Um, science wins. You know, vaccine development has been fantastic. Novel treatment has been fantastic. But nature has a way of punishing the arrogant. So be reasonable. Be careful. If you're going in mass transit, yes, wear a mask. And this is something I really feel strongly about, which is a well-supported community hospital cannot be understated. The fact that I knew that if I got sick or my mother got sick or a loved one or my wife who was pregnant through most of COVID got sick, I had a place to, to bring my family um, where I knew they would get the best care. And the latitude and uh, freedom I was given to just practice the best medicine here is something that honestly I'll never forget. I really appreciate the support I got from the hospital and the camaraderie not between my physicians, but honestly how impressed I am with the nurses. The nursing service here and the nursing quality is beyond reproach. They really are exceptional and it really made a huge impact on, on our patients' well-being. So I really appreciate the opportunity to give this lecture. I, I feel strongly about the mission of the hospital and I'm happy to take any questions. So thank you guys very much for listening. Well, first of all, thank you for such an outstanding presentation. I uh, am as educational to me. I was able to take my hands off my face. I thought I saw you looking at me the whole time. <laughs> but what a great talk. How informative. But it's also your last part talking about the hospital. I think you are you and your team are contributors to make to get us out of this thing of what a community hospital is and, and realize things are just really done here in such a great manner. Uh, we all, one of the things like in cardiac, uh, one of our, Mrs. Lundquist said she had a heart attack. She didn't want to have to travel up to 405 and we worked to build up a program. Well, you have really created such a team that I, it's, it's just unbelievable the work you've done. So I want to tell you how much I appreciate you. Next, I, I got a message. The lecture has been recorded, and in a few days, it will be you'll be able to see it on the T Torrent Memorial website. This was such a phenomenal lecture, and I believe me, I've been to tons. It, you just tell your friends uh, that they have to see this. It, it's just very critical. So, again, we'll start with some questions. Uh, first question, Dr. McKinnell: Will we need a booster shot, and can it be combined with the flu shot? So it's a good question. Uh, again, using some back of the napkin calculations, um, what we've seen is that patients who get infected with COVID, they develop a natural immunity. And it's not a, it's not a perfect natural immunity, but natural immunity seems to last at least a year. And I would say longer, but we've only really had the disease around for 16 months. So natural immunity itself should last at least a year. The vaccine induced immunity is probably a more robust response. And so that might be every two years or every three years, you might need to get revaccinated. Now, that is assuming no significant drift in variants, no significant drift in immune response to these things, and assuming no real changes in your life. But that seems to be what we're looking at now. But that's predicting the future, and I'm not a weatherman, so I can't guarantee that. But that's a rough answer. In terms of combining it with the flu vaccine, I highly doubt that. These are two, you probably could give it at roughly the same time, but in the same injection, probably not. Great, uh, I do have to add one other thing. You know, I think, you know, with all the insecurity going on with this, it's such a comforting thought to know that your team has been so good and that we can feel comfortable here in our community that we're gonna get the care we need. I and mean, we see all this crazy stuff on TV. So again, I don't wanna get carried away, but thank you so much. <laughs> Oh, there's a whole team there. There's, there's a whole <laughs> no, team I know. There. What are your thoughts on using N95 or KN95 masks? What would you recommend for wearing masks? I know you've addressed that before. Yeah, so there's different recommendations here. And I think the reality here is that wearing an N95 mask or 
KN95 mask is really hard. To be honest, if you're out and about, you, you're, you're going to adjust it, you're going to move it, you're going to touch it. And at the end of the day, you're probably going to wear that N95 mask inappropriately. And I've just seen that in observations that, that people don't wear them well. In fact, even when I have to wear it, it is really tiresome and I have to stop and take active breaks. Um, we usually say that if you're in front of somebody who is uh, aerosolizing, the virus, maybe there's a marginal benefit to the N95 over a regular surgical mask. But for routine daily use, I personally think a surgical mask is just fine. I think for most people out in the public, a surgical mask is going to be far easier to wear properly than an N95 mask. So I wouldn't bother. Personally, you'll never see me in an N95 outside the hospital. Is, is there some specific that you want to say as far as what a surgical mask is? Yeah, so a surgical mask is a medical procedure mask. It's not cloth. They tend to have, um, you can buy them on Amazon now, to be honest. Um, and they're all pretty made pretty well. They, the idea here is that it's, a, it's not a cloth. It's more of a, a fibrous mesh that blocks viruses from coming through it. Um, so it's just a, a medical grade mask is what I'd call it. Okay. Uh, what's the percentage, and this is a long one, what's the percentage of city of Florence first responders who have been fully vaccinated. I've heard that it's a vast majority, minority of them. What is the expected impact of that on their care of the public and the potential transmission of the virus? So this is an easy question. I have no idea. <laughs> um, I don't know. I will say that um, I, the okay. first responder group that I've had the most interaction with, I mentioned it briefly in the talk, is the LA County Fire Department. Um, I would presume the Torrance Fire Department has sort of followed suit. Uh, the LA County Fire Department for sure has one of the best vaccine records across the county. And to be honest, I'd be surprised that first responders didn't get vaccines. These are people that, that saw these cases and saw how sick people got, um, if not got sick themselves. So um, if that's the case, and if the Torrance Memorial first responder wants me to talk to their group about the value of the vaccine, I'd be happy to take it up. But I just, I'd be surprised. Will COVID vaccines become the new perfunctory norm as flu shots are, especially concerning variants, strains, et cetera? Or do we beat COVID this time and that will be it? I think one of the concepts that people have to hold on to is that even if we're very effective at controlling COVID in our local community, there are lots of other communities around the world where that's not the case. We can look at India. Brazil, other areas where vaccine rollout is far behind where we're at. So for any of you who are thinking about traveling or any of those sorts of things, uh, where you might be exposed to uh, patients that aren't COVID vaccinated, or as we get more uh, visitors and tourists to our communities, uh, I think this is going to be a far more complex problem than just all one and done and we sort of beat it and it's over. Uh, it remains to be seen. It's, it's a huge impact. We don't have nearly the number of cases now as we did before. So it's probably too early to say, but I would be uh, careful to be overly optimistic here. What is Dr. McKinnell's experience of persons with existing chronic viruses and COVID vaccine conflicts? If yes, what are, what were solutions for this unique group? So um, we have seen a few uh, patients that have had vaccine-related side effects. Uh, to be honest, personally, I was loopy for a day. It really did send me for a loop. I had a headache and I didn't feel very well. Uh, but the vaccine in our hands has actually been really well tolerated. And we've had a number of people with chronic viral syndromes that have done very well with the COVID vaccine. That's a population of patients that may be at different risk from actually getting COVID. Um, and so there is a risk-benefit calculation that I recommend people talk to their doctors about. What's your opinion on vaccinating a healthy 13-year-old? Once vaccinated, can they go to school in person without a mask? So I think you'll see that the science is going to evolve on vaccinations of patients that are younger and younger. And the way vaccines are rolled out from um, adults to pediatrics is they start with 12 to 16-year-olds and then 8 to 12-year-olds and then 5 to 6-year-olds. And you slowly work your way down the age group as you do those individual studies. And just like you've seen with the Pfizer vaccine, they get approved for younger and younger populations. So as a vaccine is improved, as approved, I would absolutely get kids vaccinated as it's approved. As those ages go down, I would get younger and younger with my vaccines. And that's for two reasons. One, 
there are some complications of COVID in children, but also children can transmit COVID back to adults. They become a transmission vector. So it's a key way to protect not only the child, but other people in the family who may be more vulnerable. So I'm fairly strongly pro-vaccine for the, the kids as the, as the vaccines become approved. In terms of going to school without a mask, it depends on if everyone else is vaccinated, if I'm honest. And if they're not vaccinated, I'd be wearing a mask. This kind of goes on that. How safe are schools this next fall? Can students be sitting in a typical class size of 25 to 30 students? And what about social distancing? For this? It's probably going to depend on vaccine status again. Um, I think that's a really important question. You'll see that um, the CDC will change their guidance on has changed their guidance on yeah. what we can be. Obviously here, I'm not wearing a mask because I'm vaccinated. The people in this room are vaccinated. So I think you'll find that much like you had vaccine cards to travel, you know, if you want to go to uh, uh, Africa, you have to have a meningitis vaccine. If you're going to different countries, you need a yellow fever vaccine. I think the COVID vaccine is sort of use for uh, access to places where there's going to be social gathering is going to be more and more important. Uh, this is, I'm just going to ask you, what, yeah. what is your feeling about air travel, both uh, national, international, as far as that, are you, what do you recommend? So I personally am relatively healthy, no major health impacts. I've been fully vaccinated. Um, I will be traveling to go visit my dad in June. I'll be wearing a mask on the plane because it is public transportation. I'll be doing good hand discipline. I probably won't be eating or drinking on the plane, but I can do that when I land. Um, that's sort of my personal opinion is that would be reasonably fine. Now, uh, my dad recently visited me, but I've got a newborn at yeah. home, a two month old. So that was a good reason for him to come visit. So for older patients, if you have a, a good reason to go and you're relatively fit, I think it's totally reasonable if you've been vaccinated. If you haven't been vaccinated, well, get vaccinated. And your dad being vaccinated, okay, seeing the kid. 100%, absolutely. That's Held her, bouncing his arm, whole thing. Is it all right to donate blood after having been vaccinated? Yes, absolutely. Well, we, In fact, I'll put a, a finer point on that one. We were actually collecting blood from people who'd recovered from COVID. We actually used patients' antibodies, their own immune system. They'd already recovered. They built up these antibodies. We used their blood to treat other patients. It was one of the most powerful tools we had in our toolkit was to do these plasma transfusions. So um, to donate blood, absolutely safe. You know, another thing that I get asked, so I'm going to push it to you that I think I know the answer, but what about antibody testing? You know, there's people advertising that they'll do that and all that. So there's two parts to antibody testing. If you've been vaccinated and you get an antibody test, it probably tells you the vaccine worked. Um, the flip side is if your antibody test is negative, it doesn't necessarily mean the vaccine didn't work. It may just mean that you have memory cells that know how to respond when the vaccine arrives. So for those who've been vaccinated, the antibody test is largely useless. For those that are trying to figure out, well, you know, I was sick in December, maybe I had COVID, maybe I didn't. My first comment is you should have been tested for COVID in December. The second comment is if you get a COVID antibody test, say now, and it's positive, the test is not so precise. It's not so specific. And I'm not sure if you actually had COVID or another COVID-related disease, or like a, another coronavirus disease. It's not so helpful as you might think. Um, so really, the only way, to, in my opinion, to lock the diagnosis of COVID is to test somebody with a nasal swab at the time they're actually sick. All right. What would you tell a patient that did not want, I can't give you all my questions. That's fine. What would you tell a patient that did not want a blood transfusion because they were afraid the donor had been vaccinated and did not want the, and this person didn't want the vaccine? So an important concept about the vaccine is that when we give the vaccine, we're giving a small piece of mRNA vaccine, of mRNA. And that little segment of genetic code it makes for a protein called the spike protein. It doesn't make any of the other parts of the virus, just one little part of the virus, just that little exterior little spike. So if somebody's gotten the vaccine, they may have the mRNA and they may be making that little bit of protein and their immune system may be responding to it, but they're not infectious from COVID. 
that little spike protein isn't the whole virus. It's just the outer part of it. It's like carrying around my finger. It's not my whole body, but it's part of me kind of thing. That's what you're talking about. And there shouldn't be a fear for this person. Not at all. Well, could you explain the California variant a little more? Sure. So like all living things, when things grow and they replicate, there's always slight changes. So my daughter, I'm sure, is going to be smarter and prettier than I am. There's slight evolution as we get growth and as we have families and as things evolve. Well, when you have so much virus and so many people infected with a virus, you get different strains that develop. So it's a genetic mutation of that virus, and it's functionally different. I believe it's the spike protein that's a little bit different, but I'd have to go back and look at that. But as a result, that California variant can spread much more efficiently. It, is, it spreads more quickly. It causes disease faster. And at least in my opinion, I believe patients get sicker compared to what I was seeing early in the epidemic and late. So that's a variant that emerged in California. It was described, I'm pretty sure, by the California Department of Public Health as sort of one of the variants we were tracking. It was obviously tracked by the CDC. Um, and it's something that is around and circulating in our milieu of the few cases we have left. Please comment about the clinical studies of Invermectin. This person picked up on it since it showed in the orange zone. Yeah, so there's actually a growing interest in the use of Ivermectin. Uh, it was uh, led actually by a couple of intensive care physicians that tried it, much like other physicians had tried individual drugs. The clinical trial support for this drug has been weak, and it is not something that we are using regularly. We're excited to see what science may come out. But at this point, although it's been done in clinical trials, which is what that orange message means, it hasn't moved to the recommended side yet. So it's obviously something of interest. We're tracking it, we're watching it, uh, but we're still waiting to see how that drug gets uh, included in our treatment paradigm. If a 13 year old is vaccinated, would you say, well, I don't wanna make it personal, but would you send your child to school with your 13 year old? Again, I'll circle back to, I'd really wanna be sure that the people at that school were vaccinated. And I mean, everybody, other students, teachers, ancillary staff, administrative staff, be vaccinated, make sure that place is safe. That's how I would approach that question. Uh, I know it's, I, I don't I want to get you home for your dessert, but one other thing, you know, I don't want to make it political. So, okay. you know, the thing that's going on now, California has set up what they want their criteria about masking and there's the national CDC. I don't want you to have to make a political statement, but how do you feel now? What should we be following in your opinion? So I approach this question perhaps more practically than politically. And the fact of the matter is that wearing a mask for me is gonna reduce my risk of getting COVID. I'm fully vaccinated and I'm, I'm exposed to COVID regularly. But if I go into a Vons, I'm still gonna wear a mask. If I get into, a, into an airplane, I'm still gonna wear a mask. Mm -hmm. There are different circumstances where I'm gonna still go and do it. I might go to, this is not a plug for Nelson's at Terranea, but I do like Nelson's at Terranea. So I might go sit outside at Nelson's and enjoy the view. And then I'll take my mask off. Uh, but I think you have to understand from a practical and personal perspective, what makes sense for you. I'm not going to a concert anytime soon. So I really think that you want to understand a little bit more about what's my risk in this environment? What's the probability that people in that environment are going to be people that are vaccine hesitant? Because they're a threat to you. Somebody who's not been vaccinated is a threat to you. So wear a mask. And if you don't know, wear a mask or ask. Uh, I shouldn't keep holding ideas. No, one, you can't. I'm one here more. as long as people want. Right, well, it's going to come up in the fall. So what about football stadiums? So the beautiful thing about football stadiums is if you go to see a Stanford USC game, you know that Stanford's going to win. So Elvin's that makes gone. it easy. You know, That's all you have gone. to worry about. All you have to know is that Stanford's going to win all of the football games and you're good to go. I do remember at a USC Stanford basketball game, the uh, Stanford band held dollars up and went like that. <laughs> all right, a well, bit cheeky, I will admit that. Yeah, uh, we won't get into that. I, I really, I want to be able to moderate your next lecture so I can learn again. I, 
that's all the questions. I want to uh, thank you so much. What an outstanding presentation. And Judy, again, thanks for bringing this to us. And again, you really made us realize just how important community hospital can be. So thank all of you. Oh my goodness, what a jerk I am. The people who always bring this, we have Alex and Mitch back there, our media services. I know that just when I've done it, my programs, it's a challenge to them to bring it like this and do such a good job. Again, gentlemen, thank you so much. That concludes our lecture. Thank, thank you. Thank you guys very much.